This is Kabul in 1978. These images remind us of an era when East and West confronted each other for world domination. Today, the Cold War has given way to a new confrontation, which opposes the Muslim and Western worlds. And it was in this country, Afghanistan, that this transformation took place. This is the story of the bloody 10-year war, which pitted the Soviet superpower against the Afghan resistance. A war whose after effects continue to make headlines every day. This is the story of an absurd war that changed the world. To understand how the war in Afghanistan turned into a major conflict with global implications, we must go back in history. The USSR and Afghanistan had always been the best of friends. Russia was the first major power to recognize the state of Afghanistan in 1919, just as Afghanistan would be the first country to recognize Soviet Russia in 1921. Throughout the 20th century, relations between the two countries were excellent and Soviet leaders were at great pains to pamper Afghanistan. This buffer state, with its strategic location at the heart of Central Asia, wedged between the USSR to the north, Iran to the west, and China and Pakistan to the east. In the 1970s, Afghanistan was a liberal republic run by President Daoud Khan, who got on marvelously with the Soviets. At the time, Moscow was Kabul's main economic partner. The USSR was actively involved in the country's construction drive and hundreds of Soviet advisors were sent to Afghanistan. The honeymoon between the two countries paradoxically came to an end the day the communists seized power in Kabul on the 27th of April, 1978. <laughs> The People's Democratic Party of Afghanistan, led by Nur Muhammad Taraki, seized power by means of a bloody coup d'etat. Despite Taraki's communist credentials, the Soviets were furious. It took the Kremlin several months to accept this ill-timed revolution. The Secretary General of the Soviet Communist Party, Leonid Brezhnev, finally did so to escape the disapproval of other socialist powers around the world. In December 1978, eight months after seizing power, President Taraki finally arrived in Moscow to sign a friendship treaty between the two countries, an economic and military treaty which secured Soviet aid for the new communist regime in Afghanistan. Ce que les Russes n'avaient pas saisi, à mon avis, c'est à quel point le Parti communiste, le Hulk, était révolutionnaire. Qu'ils avaient vraiment euh, une vision idéologique de transformation d'une société dite féodale vers une société socialiste. The transition from feudal to socialist society was to be brought about by agrarian reform. This was the Afghan communists' first failure. This excessively brutal reform, which failed to take ancestral traditions into account, was not well received by landowners in the provinces. The second stumbling block was educational reform. The government in Kabul decreed that school was compulsory for girls. The religious authorities violently opposed this measure. The mullahs, who opposed the communists, were cracked down on harshly. Attacking religious leaders can be very dangerous, as the Soviets knew only too well. Especially as in February 1979, a revolution in neighboring Iran had just brought Ayatollah Khomeini to power. Right on Afghanistan's doorstep, a veritable theocracy was being established, an Islamic Republic run by the mullahs. At the Kremlin, events in Iran were observed very closely. This revolution was a real slap in the face for the American enemy as it brought down the Shah's regime, which was supported by Washington. The Soviets repeatedly tried to calm the anti-religious fervor of the Afghan communists, but to no avail. 
یک تعداد از این مردمان حزب دموکراتیک خلق افغانستان که پیشتر یادآوری کردم اونا روحانیون افغانستان را مردم که چیز هستن مذهبی هستن در افغانستان و روحیه از اونا را و طریقی از اونا را طرز برخورد خود را به اونا ایار نسختن عالم دین یا شخصیت های روحانی که در جامعه بسیار محبوبیت دارن اونا را به شهادت روزن یا, یا ای که بردنش در زندان ها انداختن و در پالوی از او یک اس... حکومت دکتاتوری را شروع کردن که مطلقا آزادی را از مردم سلب کردن هیچ کس, هیچ کس حق نداشت که رادیو بشنوه هیچ کس حق نداشت که اخبار بخونه و هیچ کس حق نداشت که سر رهبرای کمونیستی صحبت کنه On the 15th of March 1979 in Herat, a town in the west of the country, an entire division of the regular Afghan army rebelled. It was under the command of Captain Turan Ismail, who would thereafter become famous under the name Ismail Khan as a warlord of the Afghan resistance. We had a few people in the Urdu of Afghanistan in the past. We had a few people دینی خود و به ارتباط مسائل وطن دوستی که داشتیم در مدت تانستیم که تمام اصلی که در داخل اردو بود این اصلی هر به مردم توضیح کنیم مردم آمادن و اصلی هر به زور توضیح کردیم پنج روز ادامه دادیم تعداد تلافات بسیار زیاد و مبارد آمان ها بسیار شدید و اجساد به هر طرف افتیده بود ما مجبور شدیم که فرقی هبده هراتر تخلیه کنیم و تیداد صلاح مورد ضرورت با خود به طرف کوها بردیم و از اونجا باز از کوها جنگ های رو به شکل چریکی یا پارتزانی با وجود در جنگ رو ادامه دادیم The Herat uprising in which 30,000 died was a serious concern for President Taraki he phoned the USSR Prime Minister Alexei Kosygin. The conversation conserved in the Kremlin's secret archives is an edifying one. Nur Mohamed Taraki requested Soviet military aid, advocating a discreet intervention by the Red Army on Afghan soil. Kosygin was very reticent. I don't want to annoy you, but it's very difficult to intervene discreetly. The whole world would find out, and within a couple of hours, everyone would be screaming that the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan. But President Taraki was not short of convincing arguments and ideas. Just send in tanks driven by Soviet soldiers from Central Asia, Tajiks, Uzbeks, and Turkmenis. There are lots of these people in Afghanistan. If they put on Afghan army uniforms, they won't be noticed. President Taraki's idea took root. The KGB and the GRU, foreign military intelligence, started to round up Soviet soldiers to form a battalion, which would later become famous as the Muzbat, the Muslim battalion. Когда я прибыл в расположение, то естественно был как бы удивлен тем, что личный состав представляет из себя в первую очередь выходцев из Средней Азии. В основном в своей массе это были таджики, были узбеки, несколько там туркмен. Впервые, когда нам начали выдавать одежду без знаков различия, очень она кусалась, то есть на верблюжьей шерсти была. Для каких целей и для чего нас собрали? Естественно, далекий 79 год, надо просто помнить, что главное разведывательное управление, она оставалась верна своим традициям и тайны держали со всеми печатями. The secret formation of the Muslim battalion in May 1979 shows that the KGB was starting to get ready. But ready for what? At the time, no one knew, but they were sure of one thing. The situation in the Afghan provinces was becoming extremely serious, especially close to the Pakistan border, where a large number of anti-communist combatants had taken refuge. It was at this point that this still undeclared war drew in new protagonists, the United States and its ally, Pakistan. The head of the ISI, General Akhtar, came to us for, uh, with a request for assistance this is in the middle of 79. And, uh, you know, in order to conduct a covert action abroad in modern times, 
you have to have the authorization of the president, which is contained in what is called a presidential finding, which he signs. And he signed the finding, that was Jimmy Carter, in the summer of 79, to give non-lethal aid to the Mujahideen who were in contact with the ISI and they were revolting against the uh, Communist Party rule, which had begun in uh, 78. À ce moment-là, les militants islamistes qui étaient à Peshawar ont commencé à revenir. Et là, ils ont trouvé une situation qui était mûre. Ils sont revenus avec euh, des armes, ou pas beaucoup, et puis, je dirais, un certain entraînement militaire, bon, assez superficiel. Et ils ont commencé à ouvrir des fronts, par exemple, le Panchir euh, avec Massoud. Already by the summer of 1979, Afghanistan was in a state of total civil war. In Kandahar, Herat and Panjshir, all through the provinces, resistance groups were in a state of readiness. But it was in Kabul, at the heart of communist power, that the next act of this tragedy would play out. Look at these two men, President Taraki and his Prime Minister Havidzullah Amin. Two friends and comrades in arms, two Marxist leaders who believed they could establish a socialist state in record time. On the 11th of December 1979, Taraki returned from a trip to Moscow. He was welcomed by his Prime Minister Amin, visibly very happy to see the President home again. Three days later, the same Amin had Taraki suffocated by Secret Service officers. Amin seized power without giving Moscow any warning. He was henceforth at the helm of a country plunged in civil war. The purges that followed were brutal. Amin had all high-ranking officers loyal to Taraki either imprisoned or executed. It was at this point that the Soviets started to wonder who this Hafizullah Amin really was. I think it was probably part of the, the drama that was playing out in Moscow. They came up with a list of things that the Americans were doing. One of them, that Amin was their guy, uh, that the Americans were going to move short-range missiles into into Afghanistan and any number of other embellishments that simply weren't true. I don't think anybody in Washington or in the United, in the United States government paid much attention to Afghanistan at that time. But there is no evidence at all that Amin actually was connected with the CIA. There is an evidence that Amin was trying to play both against each other because he felt his position was very precarious and his position was not stable. Was I mean an agent of the Americans or the Chinese, or quite simply a loose cannon? At KGB headquarters in Moscow, everything was being considered. Agents in Kabul described a situation which was daily getting worse. Yuri Andropov, head of the KGB, passed on some very alarming memos to Leonid Brezhnev. One of the memoranda which was very, very important for Brezhnev, where Andropov essentially creates the sense of urgency, where we have to do something now before Amin's government turns to the Americans. Yet it was Leonid Brezhnev, who as Secretary General of the Communist Party, embodied supreme power. It was up to him to take the most important decisions of state, especially as regards foreign policy. On the 12th of December, a select Politburo meeting took place. It was at this meeting that the decision was taken to eliminate the Afghan leader, Havidzullah Amin, whom they judged to be out of control. At the time, the young Mikhail Gorbachev was just a deputy member of the Politburo and had no say in the decisions of the Supreme Office. Не Политбюро приняла, а группа внутри Политбюро. Старшие товарищи And here is the old guard, Ustinov, Minister of Defense, Andropov, head of the KGB, and Gromyko, Minister of Foreign Affairs. It was their decision, and theirs alone, to commit the Red Army to this disastrous enterprise. 
For the previous 10 years, the so-called détente had been in place between the Soviet Union and the United States. Brezhnev was very attached to it, and most of the Politburo understood that the slightest military intervention could shatter this fragile equilibrium. Yet these three men managed to rally the other members to their cause, which consisted of carrying out a coup d'etat against Amin and sending in a contingent of the Red Army to prop up the new power regime. This is the document confirming the decision to intervene in Afghanistan, a quite unique piece of paper. It's just one handwritten sheet, something unheard of for a document of such importance. Furthermore, the decision itself is worded very vaguely, merely conferring on the three men the power to take the necessary measures for restoring order in Afghanistan. Yet even the word Afghanistan does not appear, the country being designated simply by the letter A. Drawn up on the 12th of December 1979, it was only countersigned on the 26th of that month by the other members of the Politburo, with the exception of Kosygin, who never approved of it. The coup d'etat aimed at eliminating President Amin could now go ahead. Правительство. Его пытались отравить. Был внедрен повар в его систему. Это было не проблема сделать. Потому что такое доверие было к советским людям, дипломатам, к врачам, что внедрить там повара своего проблем-то не было. Тогда очень популярна была кола в Афганистане. Она у нас еще и не было, по-моему. Вот. Это такой достаточно ядовитый напиток, но уничтожает все, в том числе и яд. И те, кто запивали колой, вот, действие этого яда, ну, практически это там вышло на уровень отравления. Thanks to Coca-Cola, Amin survived the poisoning attempt. So the KGB decided to launch a military assault on the presidential palace. Operation Storm was launched at 7:15 p.m. Its aim to finish off the job and eliminate Amin. Что там было, вот в эти 45 минут, ну, передать словами сложно, поскольку там э, сплошная стрельба. Э, Шилка стреляет по дворцу, снаряды на нас, на наши головы, гранатометы. И на втором этаже мы обнаружили у бара лежачего мина. В моей машине сидел Уильям Зой, который опознал Амина. И только после этого я доложил в центр о том, что э, Амина нет в живых. А конкретно сказал главному конец. Пытались найти э, документальное подтверждение, что Амин – агент ЦРУ. Я э, знаю точно, что группа людей, которая была в моей группе на четвертой, э, четвертой машине, специально пытались найти эти материалы. Материалов таких обнаружено не было в дворце. In the night of the 27th to the 28th of December, 100,000 Red Army soldiers poured into Afghanistan. According to the official wording, it was a limited contingent aimed at upholding the communist regime in Afghanistan. It was this man, Babrak Kamal, who took the reins of power. Chosen by Moscow, he patiently awaited his moment in a military base. در شب اعلان شنیدیم که ببرا کارمل اعلان کرد که کوهای شوروی آمده به افغانستان شب سخت بود و روز بعدش بعد من خود من کوهای شوروی را دیدم که در روی جاده ها در نزدیک خانه ما در ایجا بودن یک روز بود که فکر کردم که سرنوشت مردم افغانستان تغییر کرده و شخص خودم هم که قبل از اون متعلم و مت... محصل بودم فکر کردم که زندگی بر همه ما تغییر کرده 
les Russes ne sont pas rentrés pour combattre l'insurrection islamique, ils sont rentrés pour remplacer un régime communiste qui était devenu euh, hors contrôle par un régime pro-soviétique supposé être plus modéré et supposé, disons, euh, faire la paix euh, avec la population afghane. How could the Kremlin old guard have believed that sending in troops would improve the chances of peace with the Afghan people? The result would be the exact opposite, with an eventual knock-on effect around the world. وقتی که بالای یک کشور کس تجاوز بکنه این حق شرعی است که باید در مقابلشان استاد کن استاد شیم و استاد شوند و جهاد بکنند بنا به احکام و و و آیات قرآن پاک مردم افغانستان در مقابل قوای متجاوز شوروی وقت جهاد جهاد خود آغاز کردند و هر کسی نمیتونه مجاهد شود جاد دروازه رحمت است که خدا به عزیزترین بروی عزیزترین بنده هایش باز میکنند It was at exactly this moment as foreign troops entered the country that the situation took on a new dimension. What had been an Afghan civil war was now declared a holy war, affecting the entire Muslim world. No one in the USSR was aware of what was going on. Pravda published a simple dispatch announcing that in response to a request from the Afghan government, Soviet troops had entered the country to repel foreign aggression. The communique ended with the following words, having been judged by his people, Amin was sentenced to death and executed. Until that morning of the 28th of December, no one in Moscow had even known the operation was underway. В гости навестись же человека, который приехал в Грузию. Мы с ним много говорили. Утром просыпаемся. По сути дела, даже и подъем был преждевременный. Нам говорят, вот такое. Я в обвозе пограничного континента. В Афганистан. До этого ни я, ни он ничего не знали. Он кандидат в члены Политбюро, и я кандидат в члены Политбюро. И мы не знали. Но это вообще из ряда вон. A few days after the troops entered the country on the 4th of January 1980, American President Jimmy Carter reacted publicly with a televised address. This is a callous violation of international law and the United Nations Charter. It is a deliberate effort of a powerful atheistic government to subjugate an independent Islamic people. Jimmy Carter felt, I think, a huge personal insult from uh, Brezhnev, whom he uh, thought he had gotten to know a little bit. So when the Soviets invaded uh, Afghanistan in 1979, Carter made the unfortunate statement, looking very naive, saying, I've learned more about the Soviet Union in the past 24 hours than I've learned in my entire lifetime. Carter was rather relaxed about, uh, um, about uh, the Soviet Union and believed naively uh, that he could go to the bargaining table and uh, sort things out in a way that would, if not end the Cold War, at least uh, ameliorate it and make it uh, safer. The reaction around the world was unanimous. In January 1980, the USSR was condemned by the majority of the member countries of the UN, including those Muslim nations not traditionally aligned as allies of the Soviets. Carter froze the ratification of treaties. The détente between the two blocs was well and truly in pieces. And very quickly, uh, Carter said, OK, we're going to not go to the Moscow Olympics next year. We're going to cancel some consular agreements and some grain deals. And that was uh, sort of the overt thing. And then he told CIA, OK, 
it's time for you to get uh, get to work over there and provide, uh, and this is the change, lethal assistance to uh, the Afghan resistance. Just five years earlier, we'd, we'd ended our own Vietnam nightmare. This idea of comparing the nightmare of Vietnam to that of Afghanistan came from Jimmy Carter's defense advisor, Zbigniew Brzezinski, known as a fierce anti-communist. I remember the day the Soviets walked into Kabul and occupied Afghanistan. I gave the president a memo which had the sentence in it, we now have the opportunity to give the Soviet Union its Vietnam. And we acted accordingly for the first time in the history of the entire Cold War. Brzezinski came in and completely muddled uh, that policy because he was so anti-Soviet with his own East European background. So uh, the origins of that were in January of uh, 1980. Then Brzezinski goes out and talks to Mohammad Zio Haq, the president of, of uh, Pakistan, and he goes up to Michney Point uh, looking into Afghanistan there from uh, the Khyber Pass. And he picked up that Kalashnikov and sort of pointed into the into Afghanistan, and at that moment, um, the American commitment was, was vividly demonstrated. Yeah, that land over there is yours. You'll go back to it one day, because your fight will prevail, and you'll have your homes and your mosques back again, because your cause is right, and God is on your side. He wanted to be uh, known as one who's in charge of this operation. And at the level of the uh, la haute politique, he was in charge, but in reality, operationally, it was the CIA that was running it. We had no presence in, in Afghanistan. Who had the presence and the access to the Afghanis themselves? It was the Pakistani. When we approached the Pakistanis, we said, uh, we're with you on this thing, and we'll pull together a team. Like-minded countries, the Saudis, the, Ch the Chinese, the Egyptians, the British, the Americans, uh, and the Pakistanis. The first thing we did was we bought a huge number of uh, Enfield 303 rifles uh, from the British. And within a, you know, a couple of months of the invasion, we had delivered these in into Pakistan, and at that time, it was the preferred weapon of, a, of an Afghan. And so uh, that began it, and it began with a $10 million here, and then Congress started getting involved, and then another $20 million there, and it grew over the years. The CIA's program for arming the Afghan Mujahideen was given the codename Operation Cyclone. The Pakistani president, Zia ul Haq, a sworn enemy of the USSR, agreed to let his secret services act as intermediaries for the CIA, but he insisted on absolute secrecy. There were to be no American boots on the ground inside Afghanistan. All the logistical assistance and training of the Mujahideen in Pakistan had to be provided by the Pakistanis, the CIA merely financing and overseeing the operation. Sarhadati Afghanistan was good. Tauri Azadana, Mufrizahai Mujahideen, Gurupoi Kmalati, Taminatishan, Raftamad Mekardam, Bain Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, Afghanistan. Mapishter Arts Kardamke, Darmojudieti Artishi Shurevi, Dawlati Afghanistan, Sarhadatra Masdud Nakardan, Tauri Mukamal. It was just over the Afghan border in Pakistan itself, where thousands of refugees flooded that the resistance was organized. For better or worse, they were the ones that uh, basically chose the, the group together to, to comprise a seven-party group. And that meant people like Gulbuddin, Hekmatia, as well as more moderate group. But these were, from the Pakistanis' point of view, the ones that could be militarily effective. And it's true. The Afghan resistance was split into seven political groups, represented by their commanders, the most radical of whom were Hekmatyar, Sayaf, and Rabani. 
all members of the Muslim Brotherhood and backed by Saudi Arabia. They were also the main beneficiaries of American aid, since they were the Pakistanis' favorites. The CIA had no choice but to comply with Islamabad's choices. The uh, other uh, group, of course, Massoud was uh, was favored by us and by the British, who had a direct contact with them. The, the Sayaf group, which was, I think, the third third group, was mainly financed by the Saudis. We tried to monitor independently what was going to these various groups, but it was but it was difficult. You know, the bulk of the fighting and the brunt of the fighting was borne by the Afghan themselves. So in that sense, it was an indigenous resistance assisted by outside powers in terms of technology, in terms of resources, in terms of weapons, in terms of training. But even without these inputs, the resistance would have carried on. This is a point that most people seem to miss. They believe that it was the provision of assistance and the technology and the resources and the training and the money that did the job. No. The increasingly well-armed and trained Mujahideen were starting to pose serious problems for the Red Army. The Soviet soldiers were surprised by the effectiveness of the resistance in the provinces. <laughs> Все население считало, что если бы не советские войска, то они бы разобрались бы с афганской армией там пять секунд. Руководители Афганистана решали свои политические вопросы, опираясь на наши штыки. Почему? Потому что армия своя, надо готовить, надо кадры, вооружение, снаряжение, тут все, а тут все есть. И, и поэтому армия была втянута вот в эти, в эти боевые столкновения. В итоге вот такая раскрутка получилась. In Moscow, in early 1980, preparations were underway for the Olympic Games that summer, a genuine source of pride and joy for the Soviet citizens. They were already aware that the United States and 65 other countries were going to be boycotting the Games, but no one really knew why. This was because officially there was no war in Afghanistan. For the moment, the secret was still well under wraps. Вышло постановление специальное по введению цензуры, что можно освещать, и оно вышло в 80-м году, что можно, что нельзя освещать в прессе. Нельзя, вообще никакой военной операции нету, никаких войска там выполняют исключительно гуманитарную миссию. Мне в 82-м году присвоили звание Героя Советского Союза. И в газете, в Красном Везде было, на следующий написано, что капитану Аушеву, главнокомандующий суховодными войсками, вручил золотую звезду Героя Советского Союза за успешные действия на, тактических уч... на батальонных тактических учениях за боевой стрельбой. Вот так было написано в Звезде. И не сказано, что я был в Афганистане, что я командовал батальоном в Афганистане. Там. Это была идеология, но она советская идеология, тоже была ошибка. But in Moscow, one solitary voice dared to break the silence. The voice belonged to Andrei Sakharov, winner of the Nobel Prize for Physics. Сахаров к этому моменту уже был известным диссидентом до начала афганской кампании. Он считал, что это несправедливая война. Он считал, что Советский Союз вмешивается в отношения другой страны, что он участвует в сущности вот в гражданской войне на одной стороне, что там гибнут российские солдаты, советские солдаты совершенно э, бессмысленно, а что, что там убивают мирное население, что плохо. И 
Собственно говоря, вот это все он оформил и, 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 и отправил в виде открытого письма Брежневу в самом начале 80-го года. Андрей Сакаров's open letter drew an angry reaction from the Kremlin, and he was sent into internal exile to the town of Gorky. A few years later, having been elected a deputy of the people, Sakharov reaffirmed the reasons for his earlier action loud and clear. Пришел приказ, и по приказу мы встаем, взяв АКМ. Садимся ночью в самолет в тот ранний час, когда земля вокруг спала в Афганистан. Приказом воля занесла Афганистан. Красивый горный дикий край, приказ простой. Вставай, иди и умирай, но как же так? Ведь на земле весна давно о сердце режет Мечты и горести полно В народе отношение горькое было просто. Столько людей, во-первых, ребят берут, иногда даже неподготовленных туда. Эти гробы из Афганистана, это было такое потрясение для всей страны вообще. Как с неба свалилось вот But the traumas the Soviets were starting to undergo were as nothing compared to the nightmare being suffered by the Afghan people. In the space of just a few months, the Red Army's intervention had turned into all-out war, with civilian victims already numbered in their tens of thousands. D'abord, ils ont commencé de tirer avec les canons pour détruire. Ils ne sont pas réussis. Et après, ils ont mis des mines autour de château et ils ont explosé. C'est détruit. Voilà, ça c'est l'exemplaire des, des bombes pour le terrible qu'ils jettent sur nos maisons. Ils détruisent nos maisons. The war was now spilling well beyond Afghanistan's borders, as the call to jihad against the infidels resounded throughout the world. Spurred on by this man, Abdullah Azam, a Palestinian scholar and advocate of global jihad, recruitment centers for voluntary combatants opened in many countries. From his base in Pakistan, Azam coordinated the network of jihadist fighters drawn from all over the world. Some people came from outside to fight alongside the Mujahideen. People came from Philippines, the Moros, and people came from, from, from Middle East. People came from India, uh, and people came from America itself, the Muslims of America, and Europe, uh, and the Far East. They, but they were few and far between. Les Arabes qui venaient étaient en général des, des salafis, donc ils venaient pas seulement pour faire le djihad contre euh, les soviétiques, mais pour eux, euh, il y avait un élément de prédication là-dedans. Les chefs euh, militaires afghans ont alors pris la décision, en accord d'ailleurs avec euh, euh, Abdul Azam, de couper les ponts entre euh, les volontaires et la société. Donc les volontaires étaient, je dirais, maintenus dans des espèces de, de casernes et euh, avaient pour mission simplement de se battre sur le front. And so the Afghan resistance became the breeding ground for worldwide jihad. It was in the Afghan mountains that a certain Osama bin Laden, from a wealthy Saudi family, cut his battle teeth fighting infidels. At the time, Washington wasn't in the least bit concerned about jihad. On the contrary, in 1983, Ronald Reagan decided to go public about the United States' involvement in the war in Afghanistan from the Afghanistan freedom fighters 
young lady underwent torture for four months while being held by the Soviets. There was a man here whose wife was killed in front of their two children, former justice of the Supreme Court in Afghanistan, and they're here to try and tell the outside world, the free world, what's really going on in Afghanistan. And then at that point, Reagan broke the, the secrecy and he just announced that we were going to give the Mujahideen everything they wanted. Uh, and so it no longer became a secret that the U.S. was doing that. The rules had changed. And we weren't just fighting to bleed the Soviets we were, or to give them their own Vietnam. We decided that President Reagan, after he took office, and Bill Casey, who was the director of the CIA, said, let's go win this thing. And so Casey called me to his office and uh, said, you're going to Afghanistan or to Pakistan, and we're going to try to win. The two blocs were back in Cold War mode, fighting a war of influence and communications. The Americans were arming the rebels, while the Soviets were ordering the Afghan leaders to organize anti-American protests in Kabul. You have to understand that Brezhnev invaded, promptly died, and Andropov took over and promptly died, and Shabrikov took over and promptly died. And then Gorbachev, Gorbachev wasn't even among the signatures on sending the limited contingent into Afghanistan. In the three years between 1982 and 1985, the leadership at the Kremlin changed three times, and the warmongering old guard of the Politburo all but disappeared. Coming to power in 1985, Mikhail Gorbachev was convinced that Soviet society was in need of rapid reform. The period of perestroika was just getting underway, and Gorbachev was prepared to take a whole series of economic and political measures in this direction. But the most urgent measure of them all concerned Afghanistan. У меня было был блокнот, в котором несколько записей были, чтобы не упустить и не забыть. Они были короткими. Первая запись была. А я осуществлять реалистическую политику по отношению к Афганистану. Готовиться к выводу войск. Это я для себя еще пишу. Ни с кем ничем не говорил. So Gorbachev found himself in a really, really tough situation. Uh, he was losing money, he was losing people, he was losing domestic support for the war because now with Glasnost, everybody heard about terrible things that were going on in Afghanistan. В 85-м чуть-чуть по поводу афганской войны разрешили написать, писать об участии советских войск там на уровне в боевых действиях, на уровне батальона уже. Уже можно было о каких-то случаях гибели, уже можно было там о геройстве, уже можно было сказать, как зовут человека, которому дают орден. Раньше даже этого нельзя было сказать. The first effect of perestroika was the freeing up of public opinion in the USSR. Previously muzzled, the Soviet people were now free to express themselves and were gradually becoming aware that this war was a catastrophe. Gorbachev knew he had to bring it to an end. He also knew to whom he had to speak about it first. Официально или нет, я сказал об этом Рейгану на встрече в Женеве. И я ему сказал, вы, говорю, как, должны как президент знать, что мы исходим из того, что нам надо уходить из Афганистана. Мы будем это делать. Главный партнер и главный противник. Надо было говорить, чтобы они знали. Потом у нас была ведь такая политика. Все то, что я говорил, обещал в делах наших, договорились, договор записали. Мы выполняли. But the United States was very uncooperative because within the United States, especially when Reagan came to power, um, people who wanted to bleed the Soviet Union in Afghanistan prevailed. And so the Reagan administration was not interested in the Soviet withdrawal. What it wanted to achieve is the defeat, de decisive defeat of the Soviet Union in Afghanistan. By the time I was called in to uh, go take over the program in uh, 1986, on very short notice, um, I was called to Bill Casey's office and he said, 
I want you to go over there and I want you to win. I'll give you a billion dollars, is that enough? And I thought, well, a billion dollars sounds like a lot of money in 1986. Uh, he says, you can have the stingers, uh, which were already approved. And, uh, you, you know, I want you to, to uh, we're going to win now. The famous stingers, which according to some changed the course of the war, were ground-to-air missiles fired from ultralight shoulder-mounted launchers, enabling a single man to bring down an enemy helicopter or fighter plane. While the Soviets had clearly announced their intention to withdraw, the Americans delivered from 500 to 2,000 stinger missiles to the Mujahideen. The first stingers were used at Jalalabad uh, in September 1986, and they downed three uh, Russian helicopters. And overall, the Russians suffered great losses among, in, in helicopters. I think it was something like a thousand. We in the Soviet Union felt that the war was a partisan war, by increasing it. And by quality, they were in 1986. Stingers, blowpipes, anti-aircraft complexes. American deliveries of stingers helped the Mujahideen inflict a first battlefield defeat on the Red Army. In 1986, Moscow decided to replace President Karmal by a man who seemed better suited to the situation, Mohammad Najibullah. Gorbachev thought he could impose his own version of perestroika in Afghanistan and launched the idea of a national reconciliation of the Afghan people. Применили, мне кажется, правильную тактику национального примирения. Собрали лою джергу и сказали вождям племен: "Это ваша страна, вы тут договаривайтесь и так далее". И информация была, что мы уходим. И потихоньку мы начинали передавать технику, готовить их. И три года мы готовили. Мы готовили сознание руководства Афганистана, руководства вооруженных сил и все население, что мы уйдем. Я пригласила на Джибулу. И в беседе в Ташкенте я ему сказал, мы, вы должны знать, сказали и другим, вы должны знать, что мы будем уходить из Афганистана. Я это делаю вам при... заранее, чтобы вы исходили и готовились взять это все на себе. Это не значит, что мы отказываемся от всякой помощи вам. Нет. Но войска уйдут, и мы не будем участвовать в дальше войне. Для этого, говорю, вам надо, чтобы вы удержались, вам нужно изменить внутреннюю политику. Вы должны восстановить все связи, нарушенные с религиозными, духовными деятелями, другими. Это очень важно. Так трудно эта беседа шла. The Soviets were trying to bring the modern opposition into the government. The Soviets were negotiating with um, uh, Shah Massoud, who was the commander, legendary commander of the northern, northern territories in Afghanistan, northern part of Afghanistan. The United States supported the most radical, the most fundamentalist forces among the Mujahideen. Mukhalifin ya ba ibarat digar Mujahideen of Afghanistan da waqt o zaman qabul na kardan pishnadat Dr. Najibullah. Ba mi dalil bud ke jang idama payda kar. Я думаю, не все было сделано для того, чтобы с оппозиционными силами наладить отношения. Хотя разговоры со всеми и наши политические силы помогали. С Индией разговаривали, с, па с Пакистаном разговаривали, с Ираном разговаривали. Американцы ясно. И в Женеве конференция шла. Конференция принимала свой документ. 
Так что это было все серьезно сделано, не в попыхах. Это надо было сделать для того, чтобы мы не, по... не походили на трапа еще зайца. At the UN in Geneva in 1988, negotiations were concluded. Despite the reticence of the Americans, the regional powers managed to hammer out a series of treaties regarding the resolution of the situation in Afghanistan. It was now official the Soviet troops would be leaving the country. We were putting the Soviet Union in what we now know were its last days under a great deal of pressure. And the ignominious defeat in Afghanistan was certainly part of that. Uh, it was psychologically significant, it was politically significant. On the ground, the Soviet generals had long understood that the war was unwinnable and had secretly begun negotiating with certain resistance chiefs, especially with Commander Masood, who was master of the entire north of the country, the territory through which the withdrawing Soviet troops would have to pass. روس‌ها چندین بار مراجعه کردند بر مجاهدین و خواهشان می بود که ما وقتی که قوات‌های ما از افغانستان می‌برایند اگر شما باید بر ما اطمینان بده که ما خصوصا از دری سالنگ که یکی از جبهات شورای نظار بود ما باید مسئول برایم یک روز ما به یادم است که در کنار جاده سالنگ ما بودم قماندان اردو چل روسا که فکر کنم آقای گروموف بود این با پنجا ماشین ماربوی آمد و خواست همراه ما صحبت کند و در اینجا چارده مواد بر ما پیشنیاد داشت و یکی از حرفایش این بود که مواد را اگر شما برای آمرس مسود برسانه و وعده های زیاد داشتند Despite the Afghan army show of strength President Najibullah was extremely worried. He knew that once the Soviets had withdrawn, he would have to face the resistance chiefs, who had now become fearsome political adversaries. Although the Soviet generals had managed to negotiate a ceasefire with Commander Masood for the duration of the troops' withdrawal, they now received a contrary order to deliver a killer blow to him. It was an order from the politicians. As I know, by the Через Шеварназа, министра иностранных дел, была просьба вообще ослабить группировку Ахмадшаха. Наджибула понимал, что когда выйдем мы, ему придется э, войти в прямое э, сопротивление с Ахмадшахом, самым авторитетным тогда политиком и э, имеющим достаточных сил. Были против все. Командующие армии, командиры полков, дивизии. Комбаты, солдаты, да. Ну как вот мы уходим, и вот нам была поставлена задача вот просто на голову их разгромить. Мы с ними, как бы там они ни были, мы с ними взаимодействовали, организовали взаимодействие, пили чай, э -э говорили о том, э -э что мы скоро уйдем счастливым оставаться. И вот в одно, в одно прекрасное утро мы практически их уничтожили. Но приказ есть приказ. Решение есть решение, и мы это выполнили. Вот вам, пожалуйста, когда военные были против всех уровней, всех уровней, а политики настояли по просьбе на джибуллы. Ну, вот вам чистый пример. Это я очевидец этих событий и участник этого боя. For 48 hours, from the 24th to the 26th of January 1989, the Red Army carried out Operation Typhoon shelling Commander Masood's positions and killing over 600 of the Mujahideen. Yet Masood patiently bore this deluge of fire, not reacting to this final attack by the Red Army. They had no need to have any action. They had no need to have a از طرف از اینا ختم شده بود در حالی که در افغانستان جنگ ادامه داشت بین قوای دولتی که از طرف شوروی حمایت میشد و مجاهدی اما قوای شوروی ضرورت به جنگ نداشت چی بحثایی در داخلشان بوده چی دلایل وجود داشت اینها این عملی سرتاسری بسیار ظالمانه را انجام بدن او چیزی است که شاید امروز در خاطرات جنرال های شوروی او زمان آمده باشه Это была большая ошибка, не по человечески, не по военному, не по политически неоправданной меры. Конечно, это было очень плохое решение принято, позорное для для 
Так нельзя было делать. Тем более, когда... Тем более, когда... И, и даже после этого они не оказывались сопротивления. Они просто дали уйти нам и все. This shameful act was the final act of this disastrous war, an enterprise which the whole world called the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan, but which the Kremlin, right up to the end, maintained was a deployment of a limited contingent. Главное все-таки надо покончить было с этой войной. Решение было ошибочным, глубоко ошибочным по вводу войск. И решение о выводе войск из Афганистана было исключительно важным и правильным. The figures from this war are staggering. 1,200,000 dead on the Afghan side, 15,000 on the Soviet, and 6 million refugees. A country in total ruin. And today, the never-ending conflicts still continue in Afghanistan, a land known since time immemorial as the graveyard of empires. It was the war that changed the world and was the starting point for yet another war, the outcome of which no one yet knows.